Good morning, folks. Here again, starting just a moment early to allow people to find us and join in with the broadcast <coughs> of our lesson today. <coughs> I apologize, I may be coughing a bunch today, but I don't have corona. It, uh, today uh, is a special day because this study of Revelation uh, actually is going to be in Revelation today. We finally reached there. For those who were wanting to get here sooner, I apologize, but I did want to go back and do a little preparation for this because a lot of it deals with the Antichrist. Today, I thought about jumping into Revelations uh, where it talks about the Antichrist, but I think I'll uh, forego that till we get to it. Revelation is a rather large book, uh, and so we may be with it for a while. I hope it doesn't bore you. And, uh, and the irony is not missed either, the fact that we're studying about the end times in the midst of a pandemic, economic problems. Uh, I guess we're just keeping up with the times. But uh, at any rate, we're going to start today in the beginning of Revelation, chapter 1, with the what we call the introduction. And the very first thing I want to point out is that this book begins with a blessing for you and for me, and I'll show you where it's at. It starts off in chapter 1, the prologue, you might say, of Revelations. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words. That's me. I get to be blessed. He reads aloud the words of this prophecy and... Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, a lot of people read that and they think, well, they missed that one. Time wasn't near. Uh, there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, the revelation, uh, we assume, and usually we read it as if it's talking about the ultimate day of the Lord. Uh, some people said, well, no, this is talking about the Jews. I tend to go with the idea that this is a revelation to the total end times. Uh, now, in the year, in the first century, about around the year 90 something, uh, to say the time is near may not seem like a, a great idea, but you have to think like a Hebrew. Uh, the, the Hebrew thinking, uh, and you see this in Daniel, by the way, Daniel would say, uh, going to have 1,200 days. Well, to Daniel's mind, 1,200 days meant 1,200 years. So think like that. If this were in Hebrew time and say the Lord comes this year, it would only have been two days. Now, it's interesting uh, if you study your physics, uh, the theory of relativity by Einstein, and you're probably thinking, where did that come from? But Einstein's theory of relativity talks about how if we travel at the speed of light, for 24 hours, we actually uh, go like a thousand years or something. That's even hinted at in Isaiah, where Isaiah says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And uh, I've always thought it interesting that you know, Einstein discovered it, but Isaiah seemed to have already known it. And it goes back to time. For, for our timeline, a uh, thousand years, two thousand years, that's a long time. But when you're dealing with God's timeline, the God of infinity, a God who knows no space or time, then a thousand, two thousand years, it is very near. It's soon. Because on the scale of infinity, that's not even a blink of an eye. So put that in your head. The other thing is the blessing. This is something that not a lot of people talk about Revelation, but we'll, we'll see this. Here's two blessings. Uh, numbers in Revelation are important. And there's going to be seven blessings in all that were mentioned in Revelation for the people studying it. Uh, numbers are very important in this book, the number seven, the number six, and things like that. But I did want to clarify this because uh, I ran into this in a conversation not long about numerology. There is a lot of numerology in the Bible. 
but it's not the same kind of numerology that we often associate with things. Numerology, uh, in its nature, is an occult practice. It's right there with astrology. The biblical numerology is symbolic, and you say, well, isn't numerology symbolic? Well, the occult version, you have letters counting as numbers, but the purpose of it is different. It's fortune-telling and things like that. The numerology here is symbolic of good and evil. The number seven is perfect because three is perfect, and this is three plus three with the added one for God. So seven is the, the perfect perfection. Six is imperfect because it's three plus three, but it doesn't have God in it. So that's where we get the idea of the satanic number of six. And then when you triple that, 666, it is the signature of Satan, and that's talked about. Uh, it's very confusing for people because they think, well, you know, there's numerology in the Bible. And back, well, it's been several years now, there was a Bible code. And people were saying, well, I'm going to use these numbers. We're going to find things like Hitler and atomic bomb and all this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I don't put a lot of stock in that. For one reason, if you read the first book about the Bible code, it made all these predictions uh, and then the book itself was written predicting a certain date in the future. That date came and went. Nothing happened. So the test of prophecy is if what the prophet says happens, he's a prophet. And if it doesn't happen, guess what? He's not. So the people who wrote the, the Bible prophecy books using numbers and numerology, uh, they were wrong. It's almost like they were duped by the devil, which we probably ought to think about that. But you're going to run across numbers, and I encourage you, do not get wrapped up in the numbers because they're symbolic of, of people and situations. Now, like I said, the number seven is important. And so in verse four, John says, and who he's writing this letter to, uh, and there's a little bit of confusion because the letter is obviously written to these places or seven churches. And those seven churches, though, are just part of the audience because later in the book, it seems to be written to everyone. But he starts off with seven churches. Now, confusion here. Uh, these seven churches that he lists are not the primary churches of the early church. He doesn't mention Alexandria. He doesn't mention Antioch. Uh, he doesn't even mention Rome. So people have said, well, why are these seven churches? Well, if you look at these seven churches, most of them are in Asia Minor or just across the channel in Greece. These seven churches have a rather unusual marker to them. And I've honestly, I've been trying to study this too because there's something interesting going on. All of them are, I think every one of them except for one, is in Asia Minor and what is today known as Turkey. This area is one of the places that there's a little verse, and I meant to look it up to share it with you, and I'll, I'll find it later. Uh, but when Paul is talking about ministry in Turkey, what is today Turkey, uh, he calls it Asia, there's one place where he says that the Spirit forbid him to go. And it happens so quick, it passes by, people don't pay much attention. It's like, where is that place and why? Well, it doesn't give us a reason why. We know where it's at, though. It's central. Asia Minor, or Central Turkey. Uh, that area was inhabited for the longest time by people called the Hittites. And the Hittites were one of the most powerful. They rivaled the power of Egypt uh, at one point. Their empire was as large as Egypt. Their culture was a little more warlike and backwards, but it was very pagan, very pagan. Uh, and... All around it, there is this ring of churches that we're talking about. These seven churches sort of encircle it. There's something about that. Like I said, I haven't quite put my finger on it yet. But something about that's important that the presence of Christ has sort of boxed evil in. Uh, and that area of Turkey was never really, I guess you say, visited by missionaries a lot. Uh, above it, you had the people of Gaul and the Galatian church was visited but there's something about that and like I said I'm not exactly sure how to deal with it other than the fact that there's reference to the Antichrist and 
if you look at the description, uh, it fits one of the leaders of that country today, Erdogan. But I won't get into that right now. Let's continue with the book. In, in verse 4, he says to the seven churches, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. Now, that's a bunch of titles in there. We've got the one who is, uh, who is to come, oh, well, pardon me, who is, was, and is to come. Well, that's the same definition of the Alpha and Omega in verse 8. And we've always said, well, the Alpha and Omega, that's Jesus. So it's interesting to note that in this context of verse 4, uh, it's not describing Jesus. Because later on it says, and from Jesus Christ. So who's he describing? He's describing God. And you go on over to verse 8. It says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. Well, it says he's talking about God right there. But we also can connect that to say he's talking about Jesus. So here we have the idea that Jesus and God are the same. Now, John is one of the, the few writers in the New Testament that really point that out. It's the deity of Christ. Uh, and believe it or not, it's, it's still an issue. The Arian heresy of the second century was all about people saying that Jesus was the Son of God, he was not God. And then the church came up with the idea, well, the Trinity, we, have, we believe in the Trinity. And a lot of people didn't believe it. And people today still don't believe it. So you have to understand there's a lot theologically going on here that we usually just slide by and forget about. But John is sort of hammering home the idea of the Trinity again by saying that Jesus and God are the same. He's already said it in his gospel. Uh, and now he's saying it again in Revelation. He goes on, he says, From Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That is giving Jesus the, the nod as a physical being. He also mentions from the seven spirits. Now, what are the seven spirits? Well, later on we'll find that these spirits are angels for each church. He goes on in uh, verse 7. I think, yeah. He says, To him who loves us and set us free from our sins by his blood, that's a reference to Jesus, and made us a kingdom, priest to his Father, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So there's the introduction, and it even has a closing. After that, he quotes Isaiah and Genesis in a section that says, Look, he is coming. With the clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. So he does an introduction. He closes it with amen. Now, we know what amen means. It's, amen basically is like saying, even so, let it come or let it be. And he does it again. And then he has the closing about God, saying, I'm Alpha Omega, says the Lord God. The one who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Then we come to verse 9, and John, who has given us an opening with Scripture, given it the Amen, now he's going to talk about the vision. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, I think I told you last week that there are people and I, I don't quite understand these people, but there are people who always want to insist that the people we believe who wrote the Bible didn't write the Bible. That's become almost vogue. Uh, it frustrates me because a lot of this is coming out of Union Theological Seminary in Chicago uh, where these great scholars sit down, they scratch their head, they look at the Bible, and they say, well, obviously, this was written in the 2nd and 3rd century. And the sad thing is that there are people that read it, and I, I have to confess something. I was one of those people early on in my uh, seminary career. I was reading these new theories, and I thought, this is amazing. This is so interesting. And I thought, well, it must be true because these people are so smart. Well, I didn't fi figure myself to be very smart. I just started into the seminary. And so I thought, well, I asked my professors, I said, what about this? What about this theory? Uh, I always reference a guy named Dr. Cook, 
who was probably one of the smartest guys I've ever known. Um, and he would just smile. He said, well, you know, give it some time and do your research, do your study. You know, he encouraged you always to research and to study. But he always said, you know, give it some time. And I didn't know what he meant, but now I think I do. And that's this. When you study scripture and you study it not with the idea of overturning what it says, but understanding what it says, you'll see these people have an agenda. And I don't know why they have this agenda. Um, they call themselves ministers of the gospel, but what they are is ministers of goodness. And goodness, in this sense, doesn't turn out to be all that good because they're, they're pushed and teach moral relativity, which basically says, don't worry about God or Jesus. Worry about yourself. You are God. You're the only God you need, and you need to be a good person. I mean, they want everybody to be good, but... A lot of what they teach is absent from the Bible and absent from God. It's all about morally being good. If you're good, you're going to heaven, whatever heaven may be. Uh, they form a group called the Jesus Symposium, and every year they get together and basically determine that something the Bible said isn't true. It's, it's sad, and a lot of great scholars uh, have fallen into this. And I think I've said this before, too. A lot of your major universities are taught by people who are no longer Christian, uh, maybe were Christian, a lot of them are agnostic, or even atheist. They teach religion as mythology. Uh, it's an important mythology because they help build a society, it helped give us a code of ethics. But now it's time to set those ethics aside and look at the morality ethic. And that's dangerous because look where it's taken us. It's taken us into this idea that anything is okay just as long as you don't hurt somebody. Or if you're happy, then you do what you want. Now, getting a little preachy, so I'll break off from that. But what I'm getting at is those people who said John didn't write Revelation, they they attribute to, I think it's John the Elder or John the Evangelist. I think these were different people. But I think it's pretty clear. He says right here, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Well, who was on the island of Patmos? John, the gospel writer John. Why was he there? Well, because he testified to Jesus. And the Romans, uh, supposedly, the legend is, they tried to boil him in oil and he didn't die, so they banished him to Patmos. And here he is, in his own Patmos, where this happens. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet. Now, something interesting there is the Lord's day. When is the Lord's day? Well, if it was the Sabbath, a Jew would usually say, on the Sabbath. But he's talking about the Lord's Day. This may be where we get the idea that Sunday is the day of worship because we call it the Lord's Day. Now, I know that there are groups like Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, say that Sunday is a heresy, that the church changed the calendar because the church is you know, ruled by Satan. I think it's sort of like getting all upset over a Christmas tree. I had a friend once who, he wouldn't put up a Christmas tree. He says, it's a pagan symbol. I said, it was a pagan symbol. But I don't use it as a pagan symbol. I use it to glorify God. I use a symbol of the evergreen, ever life, everlasting life. That's what I see in a Christmas tree. I don't see the paganism. And yet this guy was fanatic about it. And he said, oh, that Christmas tree will never be in my house. Uh, he didn't celebrate anything. Because Easter eggs, that's a pagan thing. And it is, folks. Uh Jesus' birthday on December 25th, that's not in the Bible. It's a pagan tradition. It's the, what is the winter equinox. Um, about the only thing that we celebrate with Jesus that's in the Bible is Passover because we can follow the Jewish Passover and know uh, about when, but it changes every year. So these folks look at things that have happened over the centuries and they say, well, that's pagan, you know, this is the devil. Uh, I'm a little looser in that because I think a celebration is what you celebrate. At Christmas, I celebrate the birth of Jesus. I do not celebrate the winter equinox. I do not celebrate the tree gods uh, or the fairies or anything like that. Uh, the fact that I use a Christmas tree was just because it became a tradition in the early church. Should we take it out? Well, if you're going to make people happy, but these are the same people that want to 
right now want to tear down statues because it's like, well, it's what it's, you know, the statue doesn't mean what they think it means to me. Um, it honors people who, well, I won't get into it, but you, you see what I'm saying. It's sort of like, let's destroy something for the sake of destruction because we can. Um, and I think that's what a lot of these theologians do. It's like, let's tear this Bible apart. And when they're finished, what are they going to have left? Well, they're going to make up their own religion. And that's sort of the goal. It's not only revisionist history, it's revisionist religion. Jesus will be just a man who lived and died on the cross. God will be just a myth. And the Holy Spirit will just be uh, indigestion or something. Uh, I don't believe that. I'm not going to believe that. So there's that sermon. But John is on Patmos. And he's having an experience. He was in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? If you're Pentecostal, that means that you're having a static experience. If you're not, it could mean that he was in prayer and he was in touch with the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, it's almost like a trance-like state. But I have to be careful of that word. Say, oh, you're talking about trances. Now you don't know witchcraft. Uh, but anyway, there was a voice, a loud voice. And the voice said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Those seven churches, by the way, are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, I'm using traditional words there. In the Greek, they might say something like Thyatira. They might say uh, Laodicea, not Laodicea or Laodicea, something like that. Um, don't get caught up in that. You just call them what you think they are. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is in a, fire, in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Who is that? Well, I've had some people say, well, that's an angel because it said he sent an angel. Well, this particular angel is God because that's Jesus. That's the same description Jesus has later on in this book. In verse 17, John, when I saw him, pardon me, John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on my head and said, don't be afraid. I am the first, the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second. This is Jesus. He fits the description. He was the first and last and the living one. I was dead. Who do we know that died and came back to life? Jesus. And he says, I'm alive forever and ever. And here's another interesting point. <clears throat> now, you're going to think I'm getting sort of anti-Catholic here. I'm not. But I think it's interesting that he says, uh, I hold the keys of death and Hades. Well, that's the keys of judgment. If you ever see the Vatican, the Vatican symbol is two keys crossed because they say that Peter was given the keys of heaven and earth, and whatever he bound on heaven was bound in earth, what he loosed was loosed in earth and was loosed in heaven. And these are the same keys. Now, I'm not saying the Catholic Church is wrong, I'm just saying that Jesus said he holds those keys. Now, they say the Pope is the vicar of Christ, but that's gone a little bit out of hand because a lot of times the Pope demands the same type of worship that we gave to Jesus. So, I, like I said, I don't want to sound anti-Catholic, but I do have a problem with some of their teaching. I will say at the same time that some of their theology is very good, and they're very intelligent men. Uh, but at the same time, they, they mix in their own version of what I would call superstition. So there's my negativism in Catholicism. He goes on to say, the, Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So it's pretty clear 
what's about to happen. But something, excuse me, as I get a little too close, but something was just said that I think we need to, to pause for a second and take note on. He says, write what you've seen, what is, and what will take place after this. Now, I think, as I said before, some people have said, is he talking about the coming destruction of the final destruction of Jerusalem and the spore? I think he is. I think some of that is in the beginning of this. And I think that's why he's talking to these churches. Because these churches are going to be the stronghold of God in Asia. Rome will be the stronghold there. Alexandria will be the stronghold in Africa. Damascus will be one of the strongholds in the, the Far East, as they call it. But these churches are going to be the stronghold of what is known as Asia, or what we call Turkey. Um, and then, I think, as he says, and what will happen after will be the day of the Lord, the coming day of the Lord. Uh, and as I said, Revelations, I think, is going to cover from this moment in history right on through to the final moment of history. Now, having said all that, that's, that's our introduction, because the next step is we're going to talk about the message to the seven churches. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this. As a matter of fact, I did preach a whole series one time on the message to the seven churches, and it took a couple of months. Uh, probably won't do that to you, because I want to look simply at the simplest part of the message. These churches that we're going to look at all have incredible histories, and they have incredible stories of what happened to them. Um, I would love to go into detail. I will go into some detail, but I'm not going to try to spend a, uh, you know, 30 minutes on each church. I want us to prepare yourself if you want to read ahead. Look at these messages and take out just the part where Jesus speaks negatively. Because in most of the churches, he has something good to say. He has like, well, you did this, and that was happy, but I, I have a problem. And I have this problem with you. He's very tactful because usually he starts off with the positive saying, well, you did this, you did this, you used to do this, but. And in most of these, not all, but most of these churches, it is a message not of condemnation, but of repentance. Because he finishes the negative by saying, now repent. In other words, you, you were doing the right thing, but you slipped. And sometimes it wasn't even your fault. Only one of these churches, by the way, uh, did not get that idea that you've done something wrong. Uh, I'll let you find that one, and I'll tell you later who that is. But most of them were churches that gave in to worldliness. And, and that's one of the great things, because as we look at the message to these churches, we realize it's a message to us. Everything said to these churches can apply to various church situations today. And the message there, I think John is giving to the future, is church, be careful. Church, beware. Don't let the world slip into your church because this is what happens. You allow influences. One of them, they've got a, a lady named, I think her name was Sarabon. I'll, I'll find out. But anyway, she was called Jezebel because she was a prophetess and she was given the wrong word. Uh, and they pointed out. You know, the same way that the wrong kind of theology can sneak into our church. And it has in the past and it will again. It's just, it's the same message that Jesus gave when he said, be watchful, watch out, be ready, be doing the work, the work of the gospel. Now, <clears throat> in Revelation, like I said, it's very complex, but never forget, the gospel is a simple message. The gospel, Jesus took Ten Commandments, turned it into two. He took the gospel message and turned it into a very simple message of repent, put your faith in God, and surrender yourselves. Yeah, we've we've tried to make it into some really tough hurdle race that we have to run and jump over all these hurdles, but it's not. Once we have accepted Christ, we have repented of our sin, accepted Christ our Savior, we put our faith in Him. From there, Jesus, what does Jesus say? Well, there's really two other commandments. One is love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the primary commandment. Then there's a second commandment. When you've done that and when you're doing that, Jesus says, now, take it to the world. Go ye therefore into all the world. Doing what? Making disciples. In other words, reproduce. Make people like you. Don't just baptize them and give them the tithing. Transform their insides. Transform their spirit. When you transform their spirit, 
you change everything else. Um, again, I won't get on a soapbox and preach about that, but it, the, the gospel is a very simple message for us. We make, tend to make it more complicated. Yeah, and like I said, the theologians that come out and try to change everything into something new by getting rid of the Bible, getting rid of God, and putting it onto yourself. Yeah, you are God. Jesus was a great teacher. God was a great myth. You are all that's important. You and your moral relativism. Be good. Just be good and you got it covered. Well, I'm sorry. Um, there's a lot of people out there saying this. And, and it's sad. You know, I, I hear the Oprah theology these days. Oprah says, there's many ways to heaven. Everybody gives her a round of applause. She said, Jesus is not the only way. Muslims can go. Hindus can go. Everybody can go to heaven. Just be good. And everybody applauds because Oprah said it. Now she might give them a car. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. The Bible is simple. And it's sort of simple in saying that Jesus told us. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nothing else is. I can't get to heaven with my goodness. I can't get to heaven just because I don't tell a lie. I can't get to heaven just because I'm alive. I have to join my spirit with his spirit. And I, I tell you this almost every week as we close up, and as we are closing right now, that it's not just about theology. Theology is what stokes our fires and makes us stronger mentally. But it's about spirituality. It's about being in communication with God through prayer, through meditation, spending a long time with Jesus. And I encourage you to do that. And by the way, we're going to do that right now. We're going to take a moment. Uh, I'm going to stop here and we'll pick up with a message to the churches the next week where we have a word of prayer. Uh, each of you, I hope, has your church prayer list. Uh, I know we get ours in, in, the, in our, our newsletter that comes to us. Uh, and again, uh, you've heard me say this for several weeks now, but, but keep uh, Davis and Carolyn Purdue in your prayers. They're still in the hospital. Uh, Davis has told me that their situation hasn't changed much. Uh, so be much in prayer for Davis and for Carolyn. He is, he's trying to go through re rehab, and she's trying to take care of an infection and get uh, her kidney. She has to do dialysis and things like that. So they're having a rough go of it, and I pray for them. I, I wish them comfort, but for whatever reason, the Lord has put this trial there, and I pray that they can go through it and be strong. And, and to Davis, who I'm sure is watching, I say, my friend, be strong. Trust in the Lord. Uh, because he will not forsake you. But let's pray right now. And like I said, I'm praying for Davis and Carol especially, but also for others on our prayer list. And for those that may not be on our prayer list that you may know, because some of you know people that we don't know, and those who are not members of First Baptist here in Lancaster uh, at your church, pray for those around you. Let's, let's have just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come this day offering you praise and thanks. Lord, I know I say this all the time, but I can't say it enough. And my words seem so, so small in light of your beauty and holiness. But I praise you, God. I praise you for your love. I praise you for your mercy. And I praise you most for your grace. And I give you thanks, God, for the blessings. For I and we are so unworthy. And yet you saw fit to love us even when we were unlovable. You saw fit to forgive us in the midst of our sin. We thank you and we praise you, God. Lord, today, I've mentioned Davis and Carolyn, but I also mentioned those on our prayer list and on the prayer list of all the churches that of people that are listening in to this broadcast. And uh, I ask God that you would just let your will be done in all situations. Give us the faith and the courage to understand and to accept your will. Forgive us, Lord, for our weaknesses. Help us, God, as I always ask. Help us to be the people you want us to be, intended us to be, that we may be servants of the Most High God, and that we may see you someday and be like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, today, uh, church service will be starting soon. If you don't have a church, uh, Randall Hatcher is our pastor. He'll be preaching uh, at 11 o'clock, you can find it here on Facebook Live. I encourage you to tune in here. If you have your own church, I encourage you to tune into that church. May God bless your pastor today as he brings a message. But as always, take the time today. You, I, I appreciate those who have taken the time to join this lesson. 
I know it sounds like a sermon sometimes, but it is a Sunday school lesson because we try to do a little more in-depth work rather than uh, just a preaching service. Uh, and I thank you for coming together and sharing in this time with me and, and the others. So, But again, my time is over. It's almost time for church, so get your big glass of tea, sit down in your easy chair and listen. Or put on your mask and head on out to church. I think that would be great. I'd be going there myself, but as you know, I have a little problem getting out in public right now, so I have to stay locked up. But it's okay. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Thanks so much you prayed for me. Now, uh, again, this is the day that the Lord has made. I hope you will enjoy it. And I will see you and talk to you next week at 930. Thanks again. Bye-bye.